Hey, it's Craig Syracuse and welcome to another episode of Walk in Faith, the show where we go beyond the image and we discover who our guests really are. You might know them from TV, the big screen, or even the world of sports, but do we really know who they are as a person? Do we know what motivates them? Do we know what inspires them? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Hey everybody, it's Craig Syracuse and we have an amazing episode of Walk in Faith. We are at Cyclone Stadium in Coney Island. I'm with my friend, Sister Shirley from St. Bernadette's. We have an amazing episode. Be right back with a new episode of Walk in Faith. Sister Shirley, thank you so much for this opportunity. And we're in a beautiful setting. I know you've been here before. Like I was saying, I have on my desk, I have a couple of bobbleheads. I have Syndergaard, I have Stephon Curry, Dwayne Wade, and then Sister Shirley <laughs> on my desk. <laughs> but thank you so much. Now, somebody said, now you grew up in Atlantic City, is that correct? I did. I grew up in Atlantic City, born and raised there, two blocks from the beach. Wow. Yeah. Like where were the casinos? Close to your house? The casinos within walking distance, but not until my senior year in high school, the first one opened resorts. Really? Yeah. So was it before the casinos? What was it like, just the beach town? Uh, beach, hotels, uh, yeah. That's what was there, I don't, I don't know. It's changed a lot now, it's of course. It's changed greatly, yeah. Do you go back at all to visit? I go back often, yes. I was just there a few weeks ago. Gambling or visiting no, friends? No, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually the sister who was my eighth grade sister in elementary school, who then became the principal of my elementary school, just recently retired to their mother house. Okay. Um, and my elementary school is the last Catholic elementary school on the island. Sister Shirley, when you were growing up, was faith and Catholicism, uh, was that sort of a strong part of your life or just something you developed as you got older? It did develop as I got older, but certainly coming through Catholic elementary school, faith was a very big part of my life. Uh, the sisters were a very big part of my life. What order was that? They were Sisters of Mercy. And now, so when you were in elementary school, you had your first sort of introduction to the sisters? Yes. Yes, mm, they actually, I only had two lay teachers all the way through elementary school. All the rest were sisters. And this was all in Atlantic City? Or all did in you, Atlantic City. Yep. When did you move out of Atlantic City? I went to college at Temple and I really never moved back to Atlantic City. My parents were still there for a while, um, but no, I just, uh, that was the end. <laughs> and so now what was it like? I mean, cause we'll get into it later, but you, you teach Catholic education now. Was it different back then compared to now? It was very different. Um, the class sizes back then were enormous. <laughs> you know, we were 40 in a class. Um, as I said, most of our teachers were sisters at the time. Um, but I think the, the, the groundwork is the same, you know, the laying out of the faith um, as a basis for everything. That was then and it is still now. Yeah, hopefully. especially the foundation that you'd build in Catholic yeah. education opposed to, you know, I went to public and Catholic and it was completely different. And that foundation is something I rely on now. Yeah. Now, when you were in elementary school or high school or college, when did you sort of get that call? When did you decide or think about this uh, is something I want to pursue? Well, I think um, like the pipe dream uh, was maybe in second grade, I started thinking, you know, but everybody wanted to be a sister then. That was like the thing to do. And, um, but it kind of stayed with me and it grew. I didn't know really what it meant then through high school. I went to public high school uh, to save money for college. And when I graduated high school, I was really very much ready to enter the Sisters of Mercy. But I received a college scholarship to play softball. So my parents said, you know, this is an opportunity you can't let go. So take the scholarship offer now, get your college education. If you still have a vocation, it will be there four years. Interesting. And so I listened to them <laughs> and they were right. It was still there and uh, it was a good thing. I needed to go away. I needed to grow up and live a little bit and learn life. And you said too interesting. You said um, it was the thing to do. So what do you, can you, what do you mean by that? What do you mean it was a thing to do? Yeah, it was like the, all of us were just attracted to the sisters. Um, you know, we would, we would go there on the weekends and, and we would help them clean and we would bake with them. And, you know, so it was a wonderful connection outside of the classroom. And it was just what we did. It's what we knew it was normal. What do you think was so like attractive about, you know, is it because of the unity, because of the family atmosphere? What, what was it that sort of that drew, that drew you in? Yeah, I think it was all of that. It was their unity. It was their joy. 
It was their spirit of working together. It was that they were involved with us also outside of school. You know, they would come to our games and dances and, uh, you know, they were just one with us and we wanted to be one with them. Okay, so now you, you know, you also have this passion for softball at the same time. Yeah. So, I mean, that's like an <laughs> internal conflict. Like, how do you, like, how do you deal with the bull? How, how do you, you know, decide? And then also, how did you know that this was right for you? Like, if someone's out there questioning, like, how do they know they get that call? Like, explain that to someone that might not know. It's complicated, yet it's simple. Um, I think for me, I knew deep down all along that there was just a very strong attraction to church and serving God and giving my whole self to God. I wasn't quite sure what that meant um, in my early years. But once I made the decision to become a sister, to say yes, uh, there was profound peace. Mm. So I knew, I just knew from that experience within myself and the struggle was gone. The struggle was no more as far as, you know, what to do, what to be. Um, what job did I want? You know, I always knew I wanted to teach. And of course, this afforded me the opportunity to, to do both. And then you were introduced to the Filipini sisters at that time during high school or college? No, actually, I never heard of the Filipini sisters in high school. As I said, I was planning to enter the Sisters of Mercy, but put that on the back burner to go to college. And I got hired out of college to teach kindergarten at a Filipini school in Hamilton, New Jersey. That was my introduction, and um, and they were amazing, and they were everything I loved about teaching and kids and prayer and community and the rest is history. Wow. Okay, so now you decided to become a teacher and you know work with the Filipino sisters. Did you? I mean, you, did you have friends at the time and family? Did they support your decision? How did they feel about it? Because it's you know it's different to say hey you know I'm gonna you know devote my life to Christ. Like not yeah. everybody understands that. Right. I would say the people who knew me best, my friends who knew me best, were not surprised. Um, even friends from high school would say, you know, we could have told you that then. And uh, too bad they didn't. Would have avoided a lot of struggle along <laughs> the way. But my mom was deceased at the time of my decision. Um, my dad cried. I wasn't sure what that was about. But after he kind of composed himself, he was happy. He was happy to know that I was peaceful and that I had direction in life. It's amazing. It's a great yeah. story. And, yeah. and this is obviously not a job for you. This is your work. This is your yeah. vocation on top of a vocation. Yeah. Sister Cheryl, that's such an amazing story. When we come back, we're going to find out more about the Filipini Sisters with Sister Cheryl. Welcome back, Sister Shirley, thank you. So yeah. we were talking about Catholic education. I went to Catholic high school, Catholic college, did not go to Catholic grammar school, but the foundation that I built in school was, it was extraordinary. It's something that I obviously use now, but tell me about your experience. Tell me what you teach now, what, what grade? Right now I'm teaching grades six, seven, and eight English and seven and eight religion at St. Bernadette. Where's that in Brooklyn? Diker Heights. That's a great school. How's that school doing? I mean, what's the enrollment like? Has oh, it been difficult our, or? No, our enrollment is very good. Um, we have waiting lists in some grade levels and uh, thank God. Okay, so tell me the difference between, you know, public school and Catholic education. What would you say like some of the main differences are? Well, I don't know if I can compare the two. I haven't really been in public education since my own public high school experience, but um, I know for us, uh, if I could quote my pastor, Monsignor Caserta, he always says to the kids, um, Catholic school is about more than just earning a living. It's about making a life worth living. And so if we're not doing that, if we're not teaching kids a faith foundation that they can build academics on, then we're not doing what we're there to do. Um, so hopefully that's the difference. It's an education that's faith-based um, and top quality in all areas. So how do you instill like that foundation of faith in a young, in a young kid, whether they're interested in the faith or not? Like what, how do you build that foundation? You don't build it with a book, okay? You build it by who you are with them, how you interact with them. You build it through prayer experiences, you know, through listening and being close to them when, when they're struggling and letting them know that there's other ways or good ways to deal with things, stress and um, challenges. 
and they're certainly facing many of those in junior high level. So yeah, we just try to infuse the faith and prayer wherever we can, whenever we can. And now what, what kind of, like, what type of success stories have you had with some of the kids that you've sort of like taught over the past few years? Um, gee, that's tough. I like to think they're all success stories. Um, they go on to high school, they do well. We have kids that have graduated who are in, you know, working in the workforce, uh, still part of our parish and worshiping regularly. Uh, that's always a success. We have kids too who go out and do a lot of service in high school. Um, so we hope that maybe that came from a foundation that we've given to them. Do you see a lot of them from going to Catholic education, Catholic school, do you see them, do they attend mass on Sunday? Is there a correlation between going to Catholic school and also going to mass? I won't have statistics for you, but I'm gonna say that Catholic school certainly plays a, a role in that, but it really comes mostly from the family. So now earlier we spoke about like, um, you know, getting the call. Do you see, has there been an increase, a decrease in women joining different, uh, whether it's the Philippines or Sisters of Mercy? Mm -hmm. Have you seen an increase or decrease, would you say? It's different today. Um, first of all, there's many more ministries that sisters can go into, and some of the communities are thriving and booming and growing, and some are not. I think it also has to do with the area of the country, in the Midwest. Many communities are really growing and springing up. Some of the East Coast communities are moving more westward. Um, so it does vary, but I, I do know that there is an increase. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah. And now, so what kind of impact do they have on the church? Like on a daily basis, I know you, you mentioned you also teach. So what are the things that sisters do with, you know, within the diocese or within the Catholic community? So sisters today, you're going to find working more right hands on with the poor. There's communities that work with women in crisis pregnancy and outreach to those women social work, CCD coordinators, and uh, pastoral ministers assisting in the parish, doctors, nurses. Baseball you know, players, the right? They play baseball. baseball. Players, yeah. Is there one thing you wish the sisters could do that they don't do currently? As far as ministry goes? Yeah. Is there anything you feel like is um, lacking? No. <laughs> maybe just the baseball team, maybe? <laughs> well, that's recreation. <laughs> <laughs> so now, you know, we're at Cyclone Stadium. You had a lot of the students here. What was that like for them to be a part of this Amazing game. Here comes the big gun. It was a lot of fun. Um, you know, they, they toted their bobbleheads around for a few days after the game. And, uh, you know, they were teasing, you know, sister was shaking your head. And <laughs> uh, so it was good. It was a lot of, it was like family fun, you know. There were so many of my students here. And, um, you know, I like to go out and cheer for them at their basketball games, their baseball games, their soccer games, their softball games. Haven't done a dance recital yet. But um, so it was nice to have it kind of switched around and, and look up and have them cheering and they brought posters and That's it was great. really cool. And it's like you said too, I mean, this is all part of bringing or developing that foundation. I mean, there's a misconception out there, right? That people think that priests and sisters, that they don't have, you know, a life beyond the church, like in terms of recreational, like you don't go out, like you just wear the habit all day. I mean, what would you say to someone that believes that? That's not totally accurate. Certainly our primary concern is prayer, our life of prayer and community together. And from the prayer comes our ministry. And then there's got to be a balance and that's called recreation and fun. And and so we do that, you know, I bike ride, I walk. I, I, saw, I saw a bike in the car. Yeah. <laughs> and I love to play softball, volleyball, and um, the sisters and I, we walk regularly. Yeah, and we do normal things, you know, we clean the house, we do the laundry, and uh, so we're kind of regular people. We don't leave who we are at the convent door when you enter, you, you bring your whole self there. No, oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. When we come back, we might have an opportunity to go on the field, try out that, uh, that arm of yours. <laughs> Be right back with Sister Shirley on Walk in Faith. Welcome back, Sister Shirley. We're at Cyclone Stadium, like we mentioned. It's very noisy here, but we'll have to <laughs> deal with that for now. But I wanted to show you something. I've been hiding it, and this is your bobblehead. Hey, my bobblehead. Isn't amazing. <laughs> this isn't the one from my desk. I have another one, but I love it. I, I actually made bobbleheads for Monsignor Casado and Monsignor Jamie, so I don't have one, but I made them for them as well. <laughs> but these are beautiful. This is beautiful. Maybe you can autograph this for me. Oh, yeah, sure. I don't know how. My son would love that. 
But so now the game that you played, is it Collars with Scholars? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Oh, yes. You want me to, you want me yeah, to so say? What is the Collars with Scholars? In my heart. <laughs> tell me, tell me. Uh, so go, the Collars pitch. won Let's for the second year in a row. Collars meaning priests, the priest, seminarians, or yes. just priests? Priests and seminarians, I believe, mm. yes. So do they have people like some kids just join the seminar just so they could play? They had ringers. Like ringers? No, 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 not really. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. They called the game, and we had runners on first and third with nobody out, and our number three hitter coming up. So I don't know if they called it legitimately or, you know, they were trying to save face, but we'll just have to see next year. So you're going to have another year, another game. I hope so. Wow. And now, were you MVP? Is that correct? Or were you? The first year, yes. First year. Now, what's your position when you play? Well, I've played second base as I played the two years here, but um, my real position in college was first base and catcher. Interesting. Yeah. So now, is it a real game or is it sort of like fun? Oh, it's you get a lot really... of fun. It's a real game. It's a lot of fun. Fun is on the top, but there's competition underneath. There's no gambling going on. I know you said you, you grew up in Atlantic City, so I wasn't sure if that was part of. Uh... Not that I know of. So the kids get enjoyment out of this. Like, what does it do for the kids? Oh yeah, the the a whole English period the next morning was all about we got robbed. They should have finished the game. And uh, they didn't like the two-strike foul rule. You know, it was just fun. Just That's good, great. good fun. And what is the kids' involvement during the game? What do they usually do? Some of them throw the first pitch, right? Or they walk around. What do they usually do during the game? Um, during, you mean after the college scholars? Yeah. Part do of the they game? have involvement with the with the game as well? I don't think so. No. So maybe we could talk about getting some of the kids involved. I know a couple of years ago I interviewed some of the kids before the game, but maybe we could. You know, we talked to Joanne. I know she has a you know relationship with the Cyclones. Maybe we could work something out to get the kids involved. Yeah, that'd be cool. But I mentioned something briefly, and Ed Wilkinson, who I think I think he still works at Net TV or the sales media, but he mentioned there was a nun. Uh, I think it's from California who threw the first ball. Chicago. Chicago, and he sent it to me, but it was it was a couple of years ago or a year ago. So I said, he just he, got an SB award. SB award. That's amazing. So he mentioned it to me, and he said you should see if the Mets would do it. So I have a good, a decent relation with the Mets. So I said, hey, I got this idea, and I told them, and they were interested. But it said that you know what we need though is we need support from the parish and from the diocese in terms of getting tickets. So oh. if you and I could talk about that, yeah. I think I can set up a Let's time talk. for you to throw <laughs> the first pitch at oh, the Mets game. Oh, that would be amazing. That would be so like. Top of my bucket you don't list. seem excited, so let me uh, make a note. Are you sure you'd be excited? <laughs> oh my god! I just said yes. you could throw the first pitch. Yes. <laughs> now, but it's, I'll tell you, it's difficult. I, I have firsthand experience, but we're gonna play catch when we go downstairs, and then I'll, I'll take some video. I'll send it over to the Mets and see if we can get yeah. you on. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm well, in. This is like a plea. We need help. We're gonna keep saying it. But what could we say to the parish or some of the kids in the diocese to support this? Because we need to sell tickets. Oh. So if I can get this going, can you say something to them directly? Will they support you? They definitely will support me, but more than that, let's go Mets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to go downstairs, and we're going to see how that arm is. Good. Come on, Sister Shirley. Here. So I, I know you like you play softball mostly. So <laughs> listen, I haven't caught the ball in a long time. So please I'll take it easy. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to get in the face. But let me ask you, what what's interesting or intriguing about baseball for you? Oh, I, I never really got into it, to be honest. Everything. Um, oh, sorry. I just love the game. I grew up playing the game. It's um, you, got you some know, arm. even uh, even through. Elementary school and high school, I, I just always wonder what kids did after school if they didn't go to practice or play a game. And um, everybody in the neighborhood played, so. They played sponge ball or baseball? No, we played softball. We played stick ball. We played half ball. We What's just, half ball? Uh, when the ball got wrecked, you cut it in half and you play with half a ball. It was called half really? ball. Really? <laughs> I never heard of it. You're making that up? No, I'm not lying, making it up. <laughs> You got a good arm. I'm not just saying that. I think maybe you should throw the first pitch at the city field with the Mets. But let me ask you, so like sports in general, I think baseball, I think it's a way of just communicating, right? Because if you and I don't have anything in common, we could just talk about baseball, maybe yeah. play catch. 
it's, it always proves to be a good conversation time with my students um, who play baseball and softball. So it's a nice connection there, but um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's just, I don't know, baseball is life. <laughs> you practice when you're home? Practice, you know, it's an individual sport, but you can't, you can't win on your own. So, you know, everybody needs to be their best self uh, with their teammates in mind. And, um, you know, it's a game where you can, you can fail seven out of 10 times and still be really considered a top-notch player. <laughs> wow. Can you use or can you use a reference from the Bible that sort of works with baseball or sports? Is there anything you use when you're teaching? Uh, how about St. Paul? He runs the good race. I use that for boxing all the time. Uh -huh. Fight the good fight. Yeah. And I think it's just all about knowing what your gifts are and using them. It's an opportunity to encourage other people. Um, you know, because you're only going to be as good as your worst player. So, uh, so there's a lot. There's a lot of references. And you could be like Tim Tebow, right? He uses that platform to evangelize and spread the word of God. Absolutely. Um, when I played, I used to wrap a rose. This is probably superstition more than faith, but I used to have my rosary in my ankle, <laughs> wrapped around my ankle. And, uh, you know, I was... I. I I always said God gave me two gifts. One was to play sports and the other was to teach. And, um, and he blessed me with the ability to use both of those gifts in my life. And like you said, you had a game, right? I mean, you, you played with the kids, you were evangelizing, yeah. Yeah. using your gifts. Did you ever think you'd be playing baseball at Cyclone Stadium? No, I actually didn't. <laughs> Well, let me, let me, we got we to gotta do another tease now, right? Because we spoke again about potentially having you pitch at City Field at the Mets, but we need support. So oh, this yeah. is your opportunity. Write to the viewers at home. Do what you got to do. to get. We got to get you at City Field. Yeah, um, my friends and everybody knows, once I saw that <clears throat> Chicago first pitch, I was all about, I have to throw out a first pitch for the Mets. And uh, so my kids are behind me, even my our alumni kids who, uh, didn't make it out to the Cyclones game to get the bobblehead. They're like, oh, we would have come. So, I don't know, come on out. Let's root on the Mets and, uh, you know, see me throw first pitch. <laughs> so, this was an inspiring episode with Sister Shirley. Like we said, we want to get Sister Shirley to throw the first pitch at City Field. So, please support Let's us, support our efforts. But like we always say, guys, we have the ability to inspire and evangelize through your words and actions. Amen.